Happy Father's Day to all the fathers, and hopefully, hopefully that you are able to uh, celebrate your fathers. Um, if they're here on earth or in heaven, you can still celebrate them, right? And um, I didn't buy a card for my dad this year, but I did post a picture of him on Facebook, and he already responded to that. So I guess Facebook <laughs> has taken over everything in our lives, uh, so it's kind of fun. Um, when Tina and I went on vacation down to North Carolina, we took him, I took him fishing, and so I posted a picture of him fishing. Um, anyway, good memories. Always making memories, right? The Bible tells us in John that God is a good father, and that he gives good gifts to those that he loves. And he said, your earthly father might give you, uh, maybe won't give you a serpent or a stone, which he wouldn't do, but he's going to give you the gift of the Spirit. Amen? So praise the Lord for that. So God's given us, always given us gifts. Amen? I love that. Our, our Heavenly Father loves us and cares so much about us that he gives us all these wonderful things. We are going to continue our series uh, today for Father's Day. Uh, in Galatians chapter 3. So if you want to turn there, we're gonna, I'm going to kind of go through it uh, kind of section by section until we get to the very end. And I'm going to start with that and read that this morning. And then we're going to celebrate our Heavenly Father. God wants you and me to have freedom. Amen? Freedom from everything of our past. Freedom from all the stuff that messes us up all, all the time. Freedom from guilt. Can you say amen? amen? I used to say that when people came into this building, this building is a guilt-free zone. Is that nice? Right? You don't have to bring your guilt with you. You can leave it at the door, you know, or let, or if you bring it with you, God will dissolve that while you're here. I, I pray that's my prayer. So you can be free in Him and know that God loves you and cares about you and wants you to be uh, powerful in Him. So let's go, if you don't mind with me to Galatians chapter 3, and I'm going to look at, we're going to read the last couple verses, verse 26 through 29, and then we're going to pray. Hallelujah. Father, oh, praise the Lord. It says, verse 26 starts with this, it says, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Can you say praise the Lord? Father, I just thank you so much that we are heirs. We are, we are, you've given us a promise. You've given us the promise of Jesus Christ that we can be free from the guilt of our sin. He paid the penalty for that, Lord, and I am so grateful. I don't have to walk like I'm not worthy, but you have made me righteous through Christ Jesus. And I thank you for that, Father God. I ask your blessings this morning on each person. God is here, those that could make it, God. Father, I pray your special blessing on Lewis this morning as he's homesick. Lord God, I pray your blessings on everyone, Lord, uh, as we receive the freedom that you've given us through Christ Jesus. And everyone said... Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm a little excited as always, and I'm trying not to, uh, I don't know if I'll ever change. You know, sometimes people just don't change, right? Been doing things a certain way for a long time. And so I just get super excited when I get a chance to share His Word with you. And I want you to receive this morning a really important part of this message, that you are free from the law, that you are free from your past, you are free from, uh, you, man, God has a future for you that is amazing, and, and we don't have to look at it as like, oh my God, I'm not worthy for a future. God has a great future for you also, amen? God wants the best for you, and that's so amazing. Like, I don't even feel like I'm worthy of that, and that's okay because I feel like I'm a sinner, and I read in Romans somewhere that we're all sinners, and we all fall short of His glory. So, yeah, so I get that, but then God says, no, you're my son. And you're my daughter, and I love you, and I have something really awesome for you. So we're going to go through that today in chapter 3. And this is the argument that Paul continues on in Galatians of the bondage that religion has put on people or the freedom we have by faith. Can you say amen? We have freedom in God, or we can put religious activities or, or um, requirements on you to be good for God. And I know this, by rules, you don't really change behavior. 
I remember raising up, helping Tina raise up our kids. And I, you know, as, as a father, I wanted my kids to do certain things. I wanted them to do it like well, but I wanted them to do it because they're, they're supposed to do it, not because we told them. Amen? And there's a transformation that happens when they get a certain age where you tell them all the rules, and all of a sudden they just do it because now they know they're supposed to. That, that, that moment where they, that age or that moment of maturity where they understand it's not because I'm, I have to do the rule, it's because I want to please my mom and dad. And we don't make them please mom and dad, but it just seems to happen that way, right? All of a sudden, I don't know what it is, right? And I remember getting, uh, becoming a new Christian. I want to know all the rules. If I, if I'm like, kind of like Andy said, I, I like the rules. I want to know what the rules are, and if I can obey the rules, then I'm, I'm, I know I'm good. So I do A, B, C, D, and, and if I do those things, then I'm a good Christian. I mean, live like that, right? Pastor told me to read my Bible, so I read my Bible. Right? Pastor said I should pray every day. And if I pray every day, God will bless me, right? If I, then if I share my faith with people, that's a really good thing. So I start to share my faith with somebody, and boy, I'm a super Christian now. I'm doing the right thing, right? Well, I can obey the rules, but you know what happens? It's just like, I, it, it just comes burdensome to me, right? I gotta get up and read my Bible before I go to work. I gotta, I gotta pray sometime. I gotta go. Carve out a spot in my life where oh, I gotta I gotta spend time with God and it's just like oh, I don't want to do it. I mean, because I have to do it, right? Because I was told I should do this thing. It's like oh, I don't want to do it. I fight with my flesh because I know in my spirit if I go spend time with God, it's really good, right? But in my but in, in my flesh, it's like oh, it's another task that I have to do. And I'm just tired of doing things. Amen. Because you don't know my life. I'm really busy. And, I mean, God knows it, too, so, I mean, God, I can talk to God anyway, right? I mean, I can talk to God when I'm working, I can do whatever, but no, but there's something about, and I, I'm not going to get on you about it, but it's just something about time, cutting a part of my day aside, where I can spend with God. I know it's going to bless you when you do it, I know it blesses me when I do it, but it's just burdensome, right? But something happens as a new Christian, after obeying the rules for a while, then all of a sudden, I feel like I just want to be in God's presence. Yeah. Do you remember that time in your life? Well, you, just, you couldn't wait to, to get off work or get done with your task and you just go and you spend time with God and you read your Bible. I remember sitting my, uh, as a young uh, a believer after a little while. I remember sitting in the, I had a uh, recliner. I used to sit in my recliner and read the Bible. I loved that. It was like me and God and then the kids would always come and sit in my lap while I was doing it. But that's fine. But it's just that I needed to spend time and that was my place. Had my Bible next to me, and I used to read. Even my cat would used to jump on my lap and, and 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 enjoy the word with me. But it was just a place that I loved being with God. I, it, it wasn't a requirement. I just loved it. So there's a transformation happening. And Paul does the same thing here. He describes how the law and uh, being of faith compared to the law. Faith is like I want to do it because I love God, and the law was like I have to do it. I don't want to have to love God. I don't want to have to go to church, right? I want to come to church. I enjoy being here with you. I, I mean, I'm like the first one up in our house in the morning. You know, Sunday morning, I mean, all the rest of the days of the week, I sleep in Sunday morning. It's like, as soon as the sun it is, it comes out, I'm, I'm there. I want to be with God. I want to spend time coming, getting ready to come here, amen? Because I just love doing this. And it, it, it's a desire in my heart. It's, it's not like I have to come and show up here, right? Maybe I do because I'm a pastor. I should probably have to show up, but it's not. A, it's, it's it's a desire. It's a love. It's a joy. And and here's what Paul was saying here. Let's go look at this. He talked about the Galatians. Says you fool in verse one. It says you foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? Before you, your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? So Paul was reminding the Galatians, like, okay, listen, it wasn't observing a law that you were saved, but it was by faith in Jesus that you're saved. There's no other way, that, that there's no other gospel. Remember, they were trying to put requirements on the Galatian church to do certain things, observe the law, and it was too burdensome. And then here Paul is like the lawyer describing these things and then giving the answer for it on how we should actually live, and we should live by faith. We live by faith in the promise. Do you have a question? Can you tell me what chapter? Galatians chapter 3. Thank you. You're welcome. 
And he says, he says in verse 3, Are you so foolish after be beginning, verse 3, so after uh, beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain the goals by human effort? Have you suffered so much for nothing? Is If it is really, uh, if it really was for nothing, does God give you his Spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law or because you believe what you heard? So he's reminding them, are you, did you obey the law, or did God give you His? Or by faith, did you believe what God was gonna was doing by through His Spirit? Do you by faith do you believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God? By faith, do you believe His blood was shed for your sins? By faith, do you believe that He rose from the dead? By faith, you became a new person in Christ Jesus. It was by faith in Jesus that changed your life. So now that you were changed by faith. Let's not go back to the law that puts all these burdens and requirements on us to do what's right. I do it right. I do it right because the Spirit of God is now in us, and He leads us into righteousness. He leads us to the good place. He leads us in what to do right. He leads us to truth. He leads us to understanding of God. He leads us to understanding how magnificent His redemption was for us. How, I mean, I didn't deserve it. I should be actually should be crucified, I should be put in prison, I should be uh, 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 found guilty for my sin, but Jesus paid that penalty for me. Can you say praise the Lord? I don't have to carry it. I'm free. I'm free. Amen? And I remember going to church after church after church. And I would be a Tina and our family's been into a lot of churches, and everyone was different, you know? Like if I was preaching in North Carolina right now, I would not be in blue jeans and this shirt. It would be a shirt tie, or, you know what I'm saying, uh, black shoes, polished to the hilt. I mean, you know what I'm saying? I did get a haircut yesterday that looked good. One of my friends, I had to get one because I was looking pretty bad. Uh, but anyway, so, you know, it was just all these outward requirements to be a minister, but it really has nothing to do with my heart, sharing my heart, my love with you for God. Amen? And so this is the, it's by faith we believe and are saved. Jesus says that. By faith, I believe we're saying. And Paul's reminding him. So consider this, he said in verse, verse 6. Consider Abraham. He, he believed God and it was credited unto him for righteousness. Because he believed, he was righteous. He believed God. When God told him to leave his land and go to another place, he said yes and he was obedient to God. So maybe obedience has something to do with this faith thing too. I, God says something and you obey him. Then faith rises up and because God accomplished what he said he was going to accomplish in my life. It's amazing. I get, you know, what supercharges me for the kingdom of God is when the Holy Spirit tells me to do something and I do it and the result is good. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I just get so excited about that, right? God says, go over there and talk to that person and I am obedient to that. And then I know it's inconvenient for me. In my flesh, I got I got work to do. I gotta I gotta go to the office. I gotta I got matter of fact, I gotta go to the office and pray to you, God. I you know I need to do my pastoral duties. I need to go study your word in my office. But no, God says to do something. When you're obedient, I mean, I, that brings me more joy than anything in the whole world. Is that God views me in that moment? Amen. Amen. And God wants to do that. And it's by faith. Faith is caused us to be righteous in Him. Amen. We're righteous because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Let me correct myself. We're righteous because of Jesus. We're not of our own. So he made you righteous. Think about that. He made you his son and daughter. He made you righteous by what he accomplished on the cross for you and me. That's amazing. So you're all righteous people right now. Come on. Come on now. Think about that. You're righteous because of Jesus. Now, you can't earn that. You just believe it. It's by faith that I believe that God loved me and died for me. I can't accomplish it any other way. And when we walk in that as believers, what a freedom we have. I don't have to try to be good. And when, you know, and when we do mess up, and how many besides myself mess up a little bit, right? The Holy Spirit is quick to remind you, hey, don't do that. Right? And our responsibility at that moment is to say, God, please forgive me. You don't have to say repentance. You don't have to say our fathers or Hail Marys or you know, give an extra offering or all the requirements that you hear about today. No. You can ask God to forgive you at that moment and He forgives you, right? But we don't keep on sinning. That's right. 
We don't keep on sinning. That's a different gospel that people are teaching today. We don't just keep on sinning, all right? We repent and we turn away. We change our mind that we need to serve God better in that area in our life. And we know we can't accomplish by ourselves. So Jesus, through his blood and through the Spirit, gives us freedom to get rid of that part of our life. So we can surrender that part of our life that we fail in to Jesus. And he can bring healing and restoration to that part of our life so we can continue to serve him with all our heart, with all love, joy, and peace, and happiness. I mean, Christianity, I mean, we should be like the happiest people in the world because we have faith. We believe what the Word of God says. So look what Abraham, let's go on with Abraham in verse 7. Understand, Abraham um, was pled for him righteousness. Understood then that those who believe are children of Abraham. So we are also ch ch children of Abraham. The scriptures foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce that the gospel would advance to Abraham. And this is what he said. Look what it says right here. And this is in Genesis also. All nations will be blessed through you. So the gospel wasn't just for the, G Gent or the, the Jewish people. It was for all nations. This was prophesied and this was told to Abraham before Moses, before the law, before everything happened. We, it was foretold that all nations will be blessed through you. So those who have faith are blessed along with the Abraham and the Abraham, the man of faith. So because of Abraham was obedient to God, God promised him that he was a father of many nations, and through him there's going to be a seed. We'll see that in just a minute. And the promise of that seed to come to bring redemption to the world was going to come through Abraham, and then all the nations will be free. Hallelujah. It's not an American gospel. Amen? It's not, a, it's, it's not what we think. The gospel that we preach has to go for every nation. Amen? All the Middle East countries, yes. Jesus died for them. Amen? Yes. All the, uh, the North and South America, Canada, Russia, all over the world, every nation, Christ died. This is the gospel that Jesus died for your sins, brought redemption, brought us back into a relationship with our Heavenly Father, made us righteous because even though we didn't deserve it, we are righteous through Christ Jesus so we can be restored to the Father so that the Word of God will be spread through the whole world. Amen. Through you and me. Amen. Amen? There's no person that God doesn't love. That's right. And we are His instruments to, to cast that love. But we have to do it by faith. So how do you increase your faith? This is what I wrote this down. I was thinking about this this morning. So I was just talking about being free, and then I'm going to say how you help, help your faith grow. How do we continue to believe that what Jesus did is true? How, do, how does it work? Like, I, I want to believe, but then I don't believe. How many have been there, right? I want to uh, serve God with all my heart. Well, I know I'm yelling right now, right? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm just like, come on, guys. This group is small, but we have great faith. You know one thing that happened to Abraham? It says that he gave me the hope of salvation, but he also said there's going to be miracles involved with everything you do. So we have faith in Jesus, but then there's also miracles. What does that mean? Miracles are miracles. There are things that in the natural we can't explain. God touches those things. So we can walk in miracles. God, I'm a miracle. You're a miracle. Great, I understand that. But there's other miracles that happen yet. Through you. In, in faith in Jesus Christ. And then when something happens that's a miracle, you give him all the glory. Right. Amen? It's nothing that we do. Jesus did it for us. Hallelujah. We're free to use the miracles that God put in you. Glory. Yes. You're free to do that. Go ahead and just go out into town and go to your workplace and just do miracles after miracles yeah. and give Jesus all the glory. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. I mean, it's faith in Him that does it. It's not you. You just have the faith to say, oh, I'm going to pray for you and pray for you. Amen? And I don't know. I told, I told the church this a long time ago. I don't take any credit for what happens. I don't take any blame that doesn't happen either. Well, you prayed and it didn't work. I don't know. I'm just <laughs> believing that God's going to do what He said He would do. That's what I believe. It's faith in His name. Amen? And Abraham did that. Yeah. Abraham, God told Abraham to leave and Abraham left and was coming unto him as righteousness. And that righteousness is, is still blessed. The blessings of that is to extend into the whole world, to you and me today. It's amazing. It's amazing. I just get so excited about this understanding. And another thing, look at verse 10. All who rely on observing the law are under a curse. For it is written, curses to everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the law. It's impossible to obey everything in the law. 
God knew that. But see, the law was to teach people what righteousness was. Because people kept on sinning. So he said, okay, do these certain things to help you understand who I am. Because in the law is the very character of God. In the law it shows you who he is. But it, it, it brought a curse because nobody could obtain the, uh, all of the law. So Jesus paid the penalty, became a curse for us, hung on a tree so the law was fulfilled so we could just trust in Jesus now and not try to follow the law. There is a gospel out there that teaches you that we got to do all these law things. And it's not a true gospel. The gospel that works for everyone is that we have faith in Jesus and that alone. Can you say amen? amen. I believe Jesus died for me. Matter of fact, we need to be reminded of that. That's why the Spirit of God helps us. When we pray, we don't know what, to, what we should pray. You know, sometimes we, I, don't, I have trouble praying for myself. But yesterday I prayed for myself. For, it's been a long time. Right? I said, God, I, I want to I be a good pastor. Right? I want to bring a, a word from you, God. I need healing in my body. Right? I need healing just like everybody else does. I need healing in my body. I tried to pray for myself. It was so liberating that I did that. I, did, I, I, I guess maybe in my mind it felt like I wasn't worthy to do that. But pray for yourself. So you want your faith to grow? Pray for others. Of course, we always do that. Well, I can't pray for myself. I'll pray for everybody else. No. Pray for yourself. God, I have, I have unbelief. I just need some unbelief to leave me so I can believe everything that you said in the Word. Cast out unbelief. Lord, I get rid of unbelief out of my life. I believe in healing, right? I believe in the gift of prophecy. I believe in all the gifts of the Spirit. We'll talk about that in our next series a little more. Talk about the gifts and how they operate and how we should use them every day. The gift of the Spirit wasn't just for Sunday morning. It was like every day. That's right. Mm -hmm. So you're out there in the world and, and you have this gift. There's a gift of giving, right? All of a sudden you see a person that is in need. You go, I'm going to write that person a check. Or give them some cash or whatever. I'm going to go help meet their need, right? It's a special gift. God, the Holy Spirit, as He will, puts out you to do. And so you just give and bless them. And, you know, you tell them, the reason I'm doing this is because God blessed me and I want to bless you and God loves you. And they go, nobody's ever told me they love me before. And then the story begins and the journey for their salvation begins because you are obedient to the Holy Spirit. That's why we're here. We're here to bring the glory of the Lord through the whole earth. Amen? And you and me can do it through the Spirit of God. So let's, let's go on. So, um, so Jesus became the curse for us. I'm going to flip over to uh, verse 15. It says, Brothers, let me take uh, an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human contract uh, a covenant that has been duly established, so it is with, in this case. The promise were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Look at that word in verse 16. It says, The promise were spoken to Abraham and his seed. Is it, you see that it says S-E-D in your Bible? It's not S-E-D-S. -S. That seed represents the seed that is Jesus was promised as the, the Holy One all the way back in Genesis that he was going to come that was a promise was given to us. The scripture does not say, and Paul explains it. Look, he goes on to explain himself. The scripture does not say and to seeds, meaning many people, but um, and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ, which I mean is this. And he talks about the law. It was written 430 years later, but um, does not set aside the covenant previously established by God. So Paul is telling you the covenant that was made with Abraham was fulfilled in Jesus. And it continues to be fulfilled in us today. It will be continue to be filled in the future. You are, are I, say, I would assume that most of us here are saved. One day we said yes to Jesus. I believe him. And then we know that we're continuously being saved. We're working out our salvation with fear and trembling. This thing continues to flow through us. We understand who Jesus is. And then it says, I believe this, that we will be saved in the future when Jesus comes back and gets us all and takes us to heaven with them. When he makes the new heaven and earth, it's going to be an amazing future that we're going to have with Jesus. Amen? And we have to have faith in that. That's the only gospel that... It will, has stood up from the, the beginning of time is this gospel that that promise of the seed was for you and me to believe by faith in it and know that we are saved. Amen? There's no works. There's no, you know, everybody's good enough to receive Jesus. Amen. Everybody has the hope of a new life with him because of the seed that was promised to Abraham. And then he said, 
there's many promises. You can go back and look in Genesis in 15 and, and go back and look at all the promises that he said you're going to stand before kings. He's going to give you land. He's going to give you all these wonderful things. Listen, as believers today, we can conquer the land that we're in. So I'm thinking about this while I'm reading this this week. I'm thinking that Madison, Wisconsin, it's ours. Because mm -hmm. we're here. That means every person, every unbeliever, every politician, every whatever, every person is God's in this land because we're here. We bring light to this, this area. So our vision of taking care of ourselves in Christ Jesus has to expand because we have to have the Father's vision. Amen? Hey, I'm saved. Praise the Lord. I'm saved. I'm happy. God bless me. Give me so much. It's just a miracle after a miracle that he does in my life. And then I need to share that with the world around us. Amen? Because this land, is, God said he'd give us this land. Abraham was going to go before kings. Could you imagine you going before the president and telling him about Jesus? Yeah. In our land? Don't we need that? Or maybe we'll start with the governor. Thank God we have a governor that fears God. That's amazing, right? I mean, we, we should be able to conquer our, at least our neighborhood. Right? We, maybe, maybe the whole city is too big. Maybe we just take the, our neighbor and our, you know what I'm saying? And give them the promise yes. and tell them the hope that you have. And share them the joy and the freedom that you live in Christ Jesus. By faith, we believe all these things. And that's what Abraham's promise was. He said, I believe in God. And he went. And so we, he made a, God made a covenant with them. That through him, the seed was going to come to us. To all the nations. And once we receive that seed... Uh, of hope by his spirits and that we're his witnesses through the world. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. I love I love the promise that God gave us. And it goes on to explain that in verses um, 16 through 20. And then he said the law was uh, let's look at verse 20. It said, Is the law therefore opposed to the promise of God? Absolutely not. For if the law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come through the law, but it didn't. But the scriptures declared that the whole world is a prisoner of sin, so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. That's the gospel. <coughs> believe in Jesus. Wow, is, that, is it that simple? It really is. Maybe part of that is maybe, hey, God, please forgive me for my life. I think there's a, a transformation that happens when you begin to recognize that you need Jesus. Mm -hmm. But it's faith in the name of Jesus that changed my life. It was nothing else. It wasn't my Catholic upbringing. It wasn't the Lutheran church that Tina went to or the crazy Pentecostal church that she took me to one time. <laughs> it, was, it was the faith in Jesus. Amen. Amen. It was believing in Him. I said, well, what about, how do I, how does my faith grow then? I mean, what do I, let's look at verse 23. It says, before this faith came, we were held prisoners to the law, locked up until faith should be, received, be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith, again, by faith. Now, uh, that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. So that means everything, listen, the gospel that's being preached around is we are no longer required to obey anything of the law. Matter of fact, Paul got in trouble with Peter because he tried, Peter was trying to get the Gentiles to be circumcised and do some certain things, and Paul said, wait a second, according to the promise that Abraham had, the seed was going to come, and if we just have faith in that seed, we would be redeemed. And, that, and, and, and if you believe in that, then that's, the, that's all you need. There's no other requirements. But wait a second. Uh, well, maybe she shouldn't eat meat sacrificed to idols. I guess, you know, the Spirit of God will tell you that, right? There's things that you shouldn't do as a believer. We don't have the freedom to just do anything we want because there's a righteousness thing that happens. There's something that the Spirit tells you that maybe there's some limitations in, in your activities because it won't bring glory to God. And you can read Paul talks about that, you know. There's, there's sexual sins, there's all these sins that, that Paul lists later on. But, you know, those are things, those are limitations. But you don't have, you don't have to, Paul doesn't have to tell you that in the Word. And the Spirit of God tells you when you're about to go out of bounds, if you will. Amen? Come on. 
Because the Spirit of God will talk to you just like me. I could give you a list of things to do and don't, but it's not worth It's like the law again. He says there's freedom in knowing and having faith in Jesus. So we, we don't have to worry about what to do right or wrong. What happens is the Spirit of God continues to speak in our heart. Come on, am I wrong or right? When you're about to do something wrong, the Spirit of God tells you, uh uh. uh -huh. Like, no, uh -uh. don't do that. Right? He does. Because God, Spirit, and the Holy Spirit, Jesus and the Father are one. They're not going to tell you anything. That, they're going to be all one. He wants you to know that you're redeemed from sin. You don't have to go back into your flesh. Now, sometimes we struggle with our flesh, and the Holy Spirit's right there with us, telling you to be careful. Is he not? That's what the Spirit of God does. He draws us as believers to the very heart of God. Come unto me, you that are heavy burden, and I will give you rest. I can't fight this fight. I can't deal with this. I need to come to closer to God. I think of the vine and the branches. We're, we're grafted into the vine, and now we have this, uh, we're part of Jesus, and Jesus wouldn't do certain things, right? So not the, there's not a law in that. It's a love in that now. I want to serve God. I believe God for righteousness. I believe that I'm set free. I believe this is really important. I believe I'm a son or daughter. Mm -hmm. Right? I believe. Now look at the last part as I'm going to finish up with this and then we're going to take communion together because I really believe that um, and I'm like, let me talk about communion as a side note just real quick. So I used to have communion. We used to do communion like every once in a while because I wanted to be special. I didn't just want to be like a religious activity. So we didn't, we'd stop doing monthly uh, communions on the first of the month. That was a kind of a thing back in the day. So I stopped doing that, and I just did it when I felt like the Spirit of God told me to do it. You know, let's have communion. But now I'm going to change my thought on that, because when we take communion, and as often as you do this, Paul said, we do it in remembrance what Jesus did for us. Mm -hmm. Man, I think like we should take communion every day, every, every yes. meal. Right? Yes. Why not? Because that way we're reminded. You, take, you can have communion at your home. Yes. Make it a special uh, thing in your house. Again, it's not the law. It's I want to because I want to honor Jesus. And I'm reminded by faith that if we remember what he did for us, that's the only gospel you need to know. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Let's look at verse 26. And this is where we started. It says, you are all sons of God. Now, ladies, this means you too. This is not like men. This is a general, neutral word. I mean, everybody's included in this word. We are all children of God. I can say that way. Think about that for a second. God, our Father, today's Father's Day, yes. every day's Father's Day for Father God. You are His children. He loves you. It's amazing. You didn't earn it. You don't have to do anything for it. But he loves you. So we are all children. So we, you are all, and these are, I'm talking about people that are, are by faith living in Christ, right? You are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. I believe what God said, that he would send his son, and he would redeem, he would pay for the penalty of my sin, and I no longer have to suffer for that, because Jesus did it for me. Yeah, through Jesus, I am his son. For all who were baptized into Christ have been clothed yourself with Christ. Now, I want to explain this to you, because this is... We look at baptism all the time as being submerged in water, and we're taking our old life, and we're putting it in the water, we come and we believe that Jesus Christ gave us a new life, and we're making an outward sign to the world, right? So I think, I think the Bible gives us that we should be baptized into Jesus. This baptism is one by faith, though. What's interesting about this word, it also means that we're dripping wet with Jesus. We're saturated with Him. Jesus is like pouring out of us, out of our pores, out of our life. Jesus is part of us. Yes. Amen. We, Jesus, Jesus is like everything. We're baptized into Christ. And then we read these words sometimes in English. We don't get the full meaning. We are like submersed in Jesus. We walk with Jesus everywhere we go. I mean, we're dripping wet with Jesus. So when we're walking past people, Jesus is like <laughs> splashing on everybody. That's what this means here. 
By faith, we have Jesus submerged in him. We love him so much that, I mean, it saturates our home life. It saturates our wife, our children. It saturates our workplace. It saturates our marketplace. Everywhere we go, we're just dripping wet. I, I sat in my office this. I just sat in my office going, man, I, I, how can I even explain this? I mean, we're supposed to be drenched with Jesus. We're baptized, submerged in Jesus as we walk our daily, everyday life. We have clothed yourself with Christ. You're clothed with Jesus. So there's only one Jesus. But we're saturated so much with his presence by his spirit that we just, people see something different in yes. you. Have you ever had anybody say that? What's, how come you're so happy? Why, what's, there's some, why are you, why are you doing this, why are you doing this for me? Jesus, amen? We give him all the glory. Think about that for a second. Satch I mean, dripping wet with Jesus, like Jesus is all. <laughs> like you just jumped in the pool and got out of the pool and you're just, whoosh, Jesus is flying everywhere. Could you imagine that? Huh? It's just, a, yeah, anointed with his presence, anointed with who he is. Yeah, just, whoosh, Jesus everywhere. That's the gospel. That's what, if you, if I say, okay, church, I want you to do something, this is what I want you to do. Be saturated with Jesus. Okay, do that and go and, and be like him in peace. You go, you know, so how do you have a service like that? Maybe you should have like a big pool back there, and as you leave, you just jump in the pool, and you're all wet, and you just go with Jesus everywhere you go. That'd be funny, huh? We could do that. It's okay, for, for all of you who are, who are baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ, there is neither Jew. Oh, look at what this, this, this is so powerful. I mean, you're saturated with Jesus, and we're brothers and sisters, so now our identity is with Christ, not with who we identify with in the past. So look at this, neither one, are, we're not Jews, we're not Greeks, we're not slaves, we're not free, we're not male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you have been belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The promise is what? Jesus. We're heirs of Jesus. Matter of fact, Jesus, uh, John tells us we're joint heirs with Jesus. We have the same authority that Jesus had when he was on the earth. Yes. Come on. Yeah. That's why God gave gifts to man and gave the gifts of the Spirit so we could be like Jesus and walk in the power of Jesus. We're saturated. We clothe with Jesus, and now we become one, one church. Maybe he, uh, maybe Paul knew what John was going to write in, in John 17, when Jesus prayed for us, that the church, the body of Christ, would be one. Could you imagine for a moment the spiritual movement? as the body of Christ goes together as one across the city of Madison. I can't go to earth, because we're just, that's too big for me to even think of. My mind can't, put, I can't go, my mind can't reach, like, how can we do that? As a, I wanna, oh, we're gonna take communion, so I won't, have, we'll say that for the next time. We are one in Christ Jesus. There's one love, one Jesus, one baptism, one Lord, one Savior of all. We are one. We're not Catholic Church or Assembly God Church or Capital City Church. We are one body that represents Christ in the world. Hallelujah. Freedom. Freedom reigns. I don't say. Um, freedom. You are free because of Jesus. You are free because he paid the penalty for your sin. You're free. Listen, you are free to represent Christ in the world. Amen. You are free to do that. Go and do that. In the name of Jesus, be saturated with his presence and his glory. As God anoints you to go and be his representation in the world. Praise the Lord.
Hallelujah. Let's do this. Let's take communion. We have a very small group today. Can we all come up here together? Can we do that? And let's come up. We're going to gather around this table here. And we're going to... Hello. You're late for church, whoever you are. Hallelujah. Come on. Let's come on up here. All you sick and all you hurting, all you, yeah, everyone, everyone, praise the Lord. We uh, we had communion Wednesday night, anyway, uh, at our group, at our our uh, uh, our missional community group. We had communion, and uh, we prayed for uh, for Jackie to be healed. So how do you like to be doing? Not good. Okay, we're gonna pray for you again. We're gonna pray.